All right, welcome back to astronomy. Let's talk about observing the night sky. There are two ways to look at our local region of the universe. One is from a geocentric way, the Earth being at the center of the universe. And the other one is the heliocentric model, which is the sun is at the center. Neither one of those is actually correct, but it's in sometimes advantageous to have multiple views of the universe. For example, in the case of the celestial sphere, it's helpful to think about the Earth as at the center of this gigantic sphere in which it's rotating around. And we map all the stars onto the sphere and we end up making star charts from that. If we project the Earth's equator out onto this imaginary sphere, we get the celestial equator. And if we project the north and south pole upward, we get the north celestial pole and the south celestial pole. An observer located on the Earth right here would have a point directly over them referred to as the zenith. And uh, you could see that from this point of view, the Earth is blocking half the celestial sphere. So the red line representing your local horizon is basically showing, which, uh, showing you which part of the celestial sphere you can see. So if you zoom in, you would see that your view of the sky looks more like a dome, which is why we use a planetarium to do simulations of the night sky, where the red line out here represents your horizon, the point directly overhead is referred to as your zenith. Here's a handheld, mo handheld model of the celestial sphere with the north celestial pole, south celestial pole, celestial equator, and then also you can see the sun, which uh, moves across the celestial sphere, uh, rises above and below the celestial equator, as we will see. So this uh, view helps us understand that uh, the celestial sphere is really kind of arbitrary in size. If you zoom way back from the Earth, you can see the celestial sphere as a whole, but the human experience for the celestial sphere is just half of this um, imaginary sphere. There's a tilt between uh, the axis of rotation of the Earth and the plane of the solar system. The ecliptic, which is the red line in this case, is the path of the sun, uh, the word ecliptic means places of eclipses, and so we would find eclipses occurring at this point, or these points rather, along the celestial sphere. This is the path of the sun, so from our point of view, this represents the plane of the solar system and pretty much the plane of the orbit of the Earth. And because the Earth has a tilt of 23 and a half degrees, we see that the celestial equator is tilted 23 and a half degrees with respect to the um, ecliptic. Here's the point where the sun is lowest in the sky on the winter solstice, summer solstice over here, the vernal equinox on March 22nd, and the autumnal equinox uh, the first day of fall on September 22nd. So we can see that that uh, is also represented on our star charts uh, two and three, which is a map of the celestial equator region of the celestial sphere. And there's that 23 and a half degrees the angle between the ecliptic and the celestial equator. Talking about measuring angles, at least on the sky dome, we can refer to the altitude as the angle of a star above the horizon. And we notice that the angle of the North Star Polaris above the horizon has this connection to your location. The angle of Polaris above the horizon should be the same as your latitude, which is why you could use it as a navigational uh, object. In Nacogdoches, we have a latitude of about 32 degrees. So we find Polaris 32 degrees above the horizon. So here is a representation of how you would measure altitude from the horizon all the way up to where the star is. Your view of the night sky depends upon where you are on the Earth. For example, if you're on the North Pole of the Earth, you notice that the Polaris would be directly overhead and stars would be swirling around or going in circles around Polaris like that. If you're on the equator of the Earth, Polaris is instead on your horizon and stars pretty much circle around in the same way. They rise in the east pretty much going straight up and then set in the west over here. For those mid-range latitudes, you'd find Polaris at an angle above the horizon equal to your latitude and those stars would move in a counterclockwise sense around Polaris. So here's the view from the North Pole where stars are moving parallel to the horizon. Polaris would be directly over your head in a fixed position. Another thing to notice is that near the North Pole region, uh, you do find that the sun uh, uh, does not go all the way below the horizon for some locations. You can see it gets very close 
um, to the horizon around midnight. So this is the land of the midnight sun here. And so imagine a day in which you see the sun for 24 hours. That also means that uh, six months later, um, you're going to not see the sun for more than 24 hours, making it quite obviously very cold during that period of time. Moving back to the equator, we can see stars moving pretty much perpendicular or, you know, perpendicular to the horizon going straight up in that case. And then for those mid-range latitudes, such as in Nacogdoches, we would find um, Polaris very close to the center here and stars moving in a counterclockwise sense around here. Stars that are located within that 32 degrees away from Polaris, at least in Nacogdoches, uh, that uh, those stars right there are referred to as being in the circumpolar zone, or you can call them circumpolar stars. These are basically stars that never go below the horizon. They never set. So that's what a circumpolar star is. You can find the circumpolar stars on star chart number one by measuring 10, 20, 32 degrees away from Polaris to find those circumpolar stars. Another interesting observation of the night sky can be made if you're out in the woods. Once I took a trip down to the uh, Davy Crockett National Forest, and even in those remote locations, I'm still thinking about astronomy. I remember looking at the trees and trying to observe the mosses on the trees to see if that um, observation was correct about uh, the fact that on the north side of trees, you can sometimes have a good bit of green moss growing and on the south side, not so much. The reason that would happen is, is that if you imagine uh, this tree uh, or this person being a tree instead in the celestial sphere or the sky dome, as the sun would rise and go across the sky like this, only the south side, as you can see down here, only the south side of that person or the tree would get direct sunlight. And so if moss only grows in let's say the sh shady side of trees, then it's going to be, be kind of burned off on the south side and then grow more um, in more abundance here on the north side of the tree where it's in a shadier area. Let's talk more about the ecliptic. The ecliptic is not only the path of the sun in which the sun moves about a degree along the ecliptic, just ticking away there one day after the other. For every day, it moves about a degree along there. It takes one year for it to go all the way around here and come back to that spot. We should also note that uh, planets uh, tend to wander along the celestial sphere. Um, and that's what the word uh, star um, originally meant was wandering star. The word planet actually meant wandering star. Now it doesn't follow exactly, the, the ecliptic is defined by the sun and that's exact, but planets will be above and below the ecliptic, but following pretty closely along there. And occasionally what they'll do is they'll back up and we'll see what that is later on in the course. Uh, to summarize some of the things we've mentioned so far, constellations are just recognizable patterns of stars in the sky. There's a finite number of constellations, 88 in all, and 12 of those 88 are, can be found along the ecliptic. Those are the ones, these are the constellations that the sun goes through and also the planets go through. So they would, you know, astrologer would say that if Mars goes through your zodiac sign, you're having a turbulent time because Mars is associated with war. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, you can imagine what would happen if Venus goes through your um, zodiac constellation. So here's a view of the celestial sphere not being transparent, but you can see these outlined regions in light blue um, segmenting off the uh, portions of the celestial sphere into constellation boundaries, Cassiopeia, Andromeda, Perseus, etc. Asterisms, as we've also discussed briefly, are just recognizable patterns of stars that are not part of the 88. An example of that would be the Big Dipper. You can see the Big Dipper down here to the lower right. The, the Little Dipper is up here. The two stars in the, at the end of the cup of the Big Dipper, Duby and Merak, point right to Polaris, the North Star in the Little Dipper. We can also uh, point out the, the belt of Orion as being somewhat of an asterism in the constellation of Orion. The zodiac constellations uh, are there because as the earth moves around the sun, it makes it look like, you know, as we go from June to August, in June, it looks like the sun is covering up Taurus 
but in August, it looks like the sun is covering up cancer. So it's not really that the sun is moving, but it appears to move from there to there because we are moving. So it's a relative motion kind of thing. So as the earth makes that one year orbit, we see the sun moving through the zodiac constellations in one year as well. So here are the zodiac constellations right here. And I was born in the month of September on September 26. So it would look like from an astrologer point of view that my, that my zodiac sign is actually Virgo. Uh, but if, you, if I look it up in the horoscopes in newspapers, it turns out that I'm Libra. And that's because uh, 2000 years ago, it used to be that on September 26, the sun was in Libra. But 2000 years ago um, is when astrology and astronomy were pretty much, you know, more closely related. But during that time, the constellations have drifted a bit. Um, as you can see here in the, the text, over 2000 years ago, the constellations um, did represent where the sun is, but because of this effect called precession, the zodiac constellations moved westward. And this effect is quite small. Precession takes 26,000 years to occur, which is why it takes a while for, uh, for astrology and astronomy, astronomy to become different um, you know, fields of um, observation. So the astrology connection is, um, if you look up where the sun is on the day of your birth, on the star chart, you'll find out that it's not um, where you think it should be according to astrologers. So have we been reading the wrong horoscopes all this time, perhaps? Um, let's see what else I got here. Uh, precession. Uh, this is a good graphic that represents precession. You can see that right now the spin of the Earth's axis, it spins once a day, orbits once a year, but this slow wobble uh, goes around this loop up here once every 26,000 years. So in thousands of years from now, we'll have a new North Star. It'll be close to Vega and close to Thuban, for example. You see the, the years are listed down here in the bottom, 5,000 to 14,000 years from now. So we can imagine procession as, as uh, much like the spinning of a top. It spins very rapidly about its axis, but when the top begins to lose its energy, you, you can remember that a top begins to wobble around back and forth or in a slow uh, kind of circular pattern like this. This is what the earth is doing. It's spinning, but it's also precessing. So there's the word precession. It's the slow wobble of the Earth's axis due to the influence of the moon. And what it means is that the, polar, uh, the, star, the North Star Polaris will not be the North Star forever, but because of the slow uh, effect of this wobble, it will be the, the North Star for the rest of our lives. All right, so, so in review, uh, the sky terms that we've talked about so far, are the celestial sphere, which is this imaginary sphere around the Earth, the celestial equator, which is the projection of the Earth's equator out into the night sky. Celestial poles are the intersections of the rotational axis with the celestial sphere. And circumpolar zone is a region where stars will never set. They will never go below the horizon. The ecliptic is the apparent path of the sun across the sky. And the ecliptic plane is basically the plane of our solar system. Geocentric, we said, meant a, these, a view of the universe in which the Earth is at the center. Heliocentric is a sun-centered view. Horizon is just that circle that um, represents uh, basically an, an, uh, an, a circle that's 90 degrees away from your zenith and uh, basically showing you which portion of the celestial sphere you can and cannot see. We also mentioned that planets are wandering star-like objects. They move across the um, celestial sphere very close to the ecliptic. All right, and we also mentioned that the uh, sun moves about one degree per day along the uh, ecliptic, and so it makes its way all the way across the celestial sphere in one year. We said that the sun was the point directly overhead and zodiac constellations are those 12 constellations along the ecliptic and it's a belt of, of, of those uh, 12 constellations about 18 degrees wide centered on the ecliptic. All right, that's all for now. Talk to you later.